for being here. I uh, used this poster that Carolyn created because I loved it. Look at the referee. Look at his his eyes looking at Rocky like, you're gonna do this, right? You're gonna save the whole Western world, right? You're gonna do it? Can we believe in you? So that's kind of like the mood in, um, in this film. She created another one with, you know, like the, the punch, and I think that was like, okay, he's doing it, we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. So uh, this is, this poster is uh, representative of the Cold War standoff, right? where the fight was being fought symbolically on the screen because we were trying to avoid fighting in real life that would have led to complete and utter destruction. So as I was working on this article in February 2002, Russia invaded Ukraine, causing scholars to intensify and re-examine their current thinking about the direction of our field of study. The invasion underlines the persistence of Cold War rhetoric in both US and Russian cultural and political life and points to dichotomies, many falls that both sides reinforce. It revealed the multiplicity of discourses competing and realigning. My argument that the use of nostalgia promotes current political goals and that those dichotomous discourses persist as an unproductive remnant remains relevant. How the nostalgic discourse fuels action and reaction on both sides remains to be discussed. The war also underlines the inbreeding of discourses between film and reality. Take a look at this post, I hope it's big enough for people in the back. It says, we criticize Hollywood for lazy tropes, but our two main antagonists right now are a former KGB agent with a penchant for poisoning and an emerald mine heir who wants to live on Mars. If these were Bond villains, we would dismiss them as caricatures. <laughs> <clears throat> so the ideological struggle between communism and capitalism, so to speak, has been widely represented in US film, from the James Bond series to films like Red Dawn in 84, Rocky IV and V in 85 and 1990, The Hunt of Red October in 1990. The Hunt of Red October, one of my favorite films of all times. <laughs> Critics have discussed the presence of uh, the Cold War in US film and TV, and you see some of those books, as well as the influence of Hollywood in shaping US public opinion and public images about the Cold War in Russia. Cinematic production and other political, media, literary, and visual cultures created and recreated what Atanasovsky, Neda Atanasovsky calls appropriate fantasies of the good and defined how United States related to its East Bloc foe. Used to justify the continued militarization of the United States, neoliberalism and the United States belief in its moral superiority, Cold War triumphalist rhetoric continued after the dismantling of the communist bloc in the late 80s and public discourses during the past decade increasingly sound like an attempt to maintain the political habitus of the Cold War period. And there's a book by Ellen Schrecker called Cold War Triumphalism that describes, talks a lot about this. <clears throat> While Eastern, Eastern European and post-Soviet nations embraced neoliberal market-based economic practices and political forms, Many have had insufficient success in implementing lasting and above all equitable political, economic, and social change. Moreover, the, precious and the pressures and austerity measures imposed by the World Bank and other international organizations during the 90s led to disillusionment because of unequal access to the European Union, experiences of widespread local corruption, and the global climate favoring multinational com companies over local workers. Over time, these experiences encouraged the development of nostalgia for state socialism. These discourses of nostalgia are captured, for example, in terms like Yugo nostalgia, uh, present in the former Yugoslavia, or the East German Ostalgie, uh, nostalgic sentiment captured by the film Goodbye Lenin that a lot of you might be familiar with that appeared in 2003. As well as in the appreciation of retro objects, retro objects, clothing, and art from the socialist period. Svetlana Oym, and you see her uh, book cover here, has theorized nostalgia uh, for the East as a, uh, of the East as a search for the stability, 
daily rituals and perceived social fairness of socialism in response to the tumultuous and uneven ideological, social, economic, and cultural transformations after 89. However, that's not the nostalgia I'll talk about today, not the nostalgia of the former communist bloc countries for communism and whatever that implies. Less attention has been paid to similar nostalgic collective emotions in the West. The recent volume edited by Tatiana Prokhorova is uh, an example of, uh, it's an exception. Initially, the fall of communist regimes seemed to legitimize Western ideologies and its market organization. Moreover, according to Atanasovsky, with the advent of post-socialism, the US refigured the Cold War paradigm of saving the world from communism to that of saving the world from humanitarian atrocities, a seemingly worthy cause. The new or second Cold War phrase used by US liberals and conservatives alike, used by Russians and all sorts of other uh, political groups, has become a nostalgic catchphrase for a variety of relationships, attitudes, and feelings that denote the US national self as strong and superior in its self-righteous relationship with the former socialist countries. <clears throat> a look at recent productions confirmed the continuing obsession with Cold War Russian storylines. The Americans is a particular, particularly interesting series because it's a more nuanced out of uh, out of them, as you know, you can do a lot in several seasons. I don't know how many seasons this, this show had. So this presentation examines the intersection of nostalgia, irony, and retro in the emergence of new Cold War storylines that dominate two US productions. The feature film Creed II and the short TV series Comrade Detective. Creed II establishes a deeply embedded emotional and cinematic intertextuality with the Cold War narrative of the 1980s series Rocky and engages in a far more regressive form of nostalgia. It maintains Cold War binary oppositions and the triumphalist narrative. In contrast with Creed II, the lesser known Amazon produced series Comrade Detective recreates the Cold War past in a more playful and progressive retro mode through its focus on a supposedly rediscovered communist era film. Through its storyline and production, Comrade Detective pretends to mimic the ideological tenets and forms of Romanian communism of the 80s, using, in Christine Sprengler's words, both surface realism, surface realism and deliberate archaism, and approaches the sentiment of the new Cold War nostalgia through ironic detachment and play. But I'll start talking about Creed first. So Creed II, uh, which appeared in 2018, returns to the storyline introduced by Rocky uh, first time in 1976. Sylvester Stallone, who portrays Rocky in all the films, co-wrote the script of Creed II. The storyline connects directly to Rocky II, in which Rocky, the white working class boxer, achieved fame by defeating Apollo Creed, uh, Adonis's father. In Rocky IV, Apollo fights the Russian champion Ivan Drago and dies in the fight. Rocky seeks revenge, defeating Ivan after a period of now mythologized grueling training and an equally grueling match, which is echoed in Creed II. That's all I'm gonna tell you about the plot. Okay, hopefully you remember. They fight, they win, and all of that. They train, right? So the original Rocky dealt with America of the 70s and 80s, when the increased use of technology in manufacturing left workers, especially white men, feeling redundant, powerless, and emasculated. The figure of Rocky responds to the perceived softening of US men and provides a recipe for regaining power. Because Rocky shapes his mind and body to hard physical work, wins the fight, and keeps the woman, he provides hope for white US manhood. Once established as the quintessential US male, Rocky defeats the Soviet boxer Ivan Drago in Rocky IV. A similar sculpting of body and self occurs in Creed II, 
because of Adonis' initial defeat at the hands of Victor Dragos, Ivan's son, which reaffirms the formula for becoming a real man. The series also adds a black character as a way to update the narrative and appeal to new audiences, <coughs> including those disappointed by the loss of Apollo in the original series. Yet Creed II does not move too far away from the mainstream formula for US success, reinfor reinforcing its focus on male physical prowess and the defeat of a Cold War adversary with a detour to retro signposts from the 80s Rocky. The first scenes of Creed II are set in Ukraine, although the film seems to have been shot entirely in the United States. A gray early morning setting hints at the decay that supposedly characterizes this post-socialist country and also revives the old story of Ivan Drago, Rocky's Russian ne nemesis. Ivan is also played by Dolph Lundgren, uh, who played the character in, in the original Rocky films, adding to the visual continuity introduced by the presence of Sylvester Stallone. In both worlds, characters left something unreconciled in the past. Ivan removed from the seat of power because of his past loss and relegated to Ukraine symbolizes the post-socialist past that, from the US point of view, refuses to accept the United States as a humanizing force and was and will become, through a defeat in the boxing match, the object of US disciplining violence, in Atanasovsky's words. Adonis is also marked by his past. He keeps watching the film of the fight where his father died, clips from Rocky II. His father's loss mirrors the fear of the US loss of status after the Cold War, and Adonis appears to forget that this loss was already avenged. This form of remembering is through what Ellison Landsberg labels prosthetic memory. Film stills of the fight found in Rocky's bar and sample clips from Rocky II that Adonis plays on his tablet are forms of portable memory markers of retro, and bestow on the earlier film an aura of authenticity and actual memory that, as Landsberg argues, is legitimizes and credentializes his way of viewing history. Adonis believes his simplified interpretation of the film's images rather than the more nuanced version of events provided to him by his mother and by Rocky, who are direct witnesses to the past. The scene become a warning about separating images from the context of their production and moving them into the context of the proliferation as part of, in Landsberg words, an individualized library of nostalgia. So Adonis watches these clips and he uses them to justify his acceptance of, of the fight with, uh, with Drago Sam, although he doesn't need that. He's kind of tricked into it by this, this narrative of avenging his father over again. Rocky is against the fight. He feels his generation has paid his dues. Apollo has been avenged. There is nothing to prove. The Cold War is won, right? But Adonis accepts the challenge anyway. His decision emphasizes the need for Adonis's generation to buy into the self and national narrative. He finds his ideal pairing in Ivan, who has raised his son on a nostalgic narrative of humiliation. Everything bad that happened to him was because of the Americans. The film encourages viewers into a new dichotomous narratives of winners and losers. I should have dressed like this, right? <laughs> I would have been so comfy. Before the decisive fight, Adonis goes into the desert to find his strength, returning to the rugged American lifestyle that will refashion him into the hero the movie world wants. He goes actually on the frontier, and we know the image of the frontier in, in American culture. Here he's mirroring Rocky's training in the original film, becoming a symbol of rugged US masculinity forged on the frontier desert. His image is softened by his interactions with his wife and their newborn baby, which indicates a return to his support <coughs> network and the value of community, rather than the isolation of watching images on his own. The match between Creed and Drago, who's played by a Romanian boxer, by the way, but he doesn't speak much, right? So <laughs> the other doesn't speak. That's another element of it. Uh, the match between Creed and Drago is a contest between ideological positions mirroring the Cold War conflict. 
Creed wears the red and white and blue flag shorts, a clear sign of his loyalty, and also a shout out to the shorts worn by Rocky. In the final fight, Victor wears the Russian colors. He's been accepted back, right, by, by Russia with the hope that, right, he's gonna avenge uh, Russia again. And um, the fact that both wear um, these country colors symbolize that the, fa the fight is between state fantasies. In the end of the fight, seeing that uh, his son is losing, Ivan throws the towel, choosing his, son was, choosing his son's well-being over that of Russia. The United States is victorious again nationally and internationally, not only by disciplining the other to fewer physical defeat, but by teaching the other the better way to humanitarian violence. Turning to Comrade Detective. Comrade Detective combines the retro mode with parody, critiquing both communist propaganda and Western self-importance in the past and the present. The series is an experiment in retro, a combination which creates an unstable and potentially frustrating interpreting experience for the viewer. In introductions to the six different episodes, producers focus on the idea of authenticity and rediscovery, from the teaser to the film showing Channing Tatum watching the series with visible excitement, to the episode introductions and the credits, which are made to look like communist, uh, communist period credits. So uh, let's hope the sound will work. I'm gonna play the trailer because I assume many of you are not familiar with this series and we can also see Come on. Mr. Tim? Thank you, Mr. I'm going to need a minute of my life. Close the door on the way out. Dearest Channing, what you have in your hands, what you have been searching for. We never gave up the quest for our favorite, forgotten Romanian television show. Perhaps now you will find some level of peace. I know I have. Roy! I need a VCR. Go. Bring some vodka with the VCR when you bring it back. Detective uses re retro signposts to create a, uh, to recreate the communist past, similarly to another series that's available on Amazon. Maybe some of you have seen it, the Deutschland series. 
However, the viewers cannot comfortably suspend their disbelief because the series instability keeps them guessing about the plot and goals of the film. The pervasive use of irony creates a double voice critique of both the past and the present and of communism and capitalism. This postmodern way to approach nostalgia questions capital truths and grand narratives. Under the magnifying glass of irony, narratives of US superiority, the American dream, and American exceptionalism are critiqued and put on a similar footing with communist ideologies. This is different than Crete, where the world is clearly separated into the good and the bad, and enemies are subdued into accepting civilizing violence. Nostalgia resides in how the filmmakers engage in a total retro reproduction that includes Romanian actors, Romanian period setting, and dubbing for English-speaking audiences. And dubbing, you know, how many times have you seen a movie dubbed in English in your lifetimes? It, it's not uh, a custom for Romanian film. <coughs> the choice of Romania was not intentional. Rather, the producers visited several former communist locales and eventually settled on Romania. One of the producers said, I remember Romania making the most sense because it has such a distinctive energy of communism you could believe that the regime would pull the trigger on such a show. The producer probably had in mind the retro patina, that is buildings that have not been refurbished, that still exist, making the retro style easily acceptable, accessible. So basically, this is a movie completely produced in Romania with Romanian actors and, you know, in Romanian and then dubbed, right? And you could see in the trailer that that aspect of it is hidden. You see Channing Tatum playing detective so-and-so. Well, it's actually only his voice in there. So the plot revolves around, as you could see, the comedic, comedic body cop formula, which references a popular US film genre. Detectives Gregor Angel, let me switch my slide. and Joseph Bachu are investigating several killings, including uh, one of their partner and friend, Nikita Ionescu, who will eventually become their nemesis. I'm kind of spoiling it for you right now a bit. The conflicts in the series are between the detectives who are faithful if rebellious communists, US embassy employees who are capitalists, of course, and corrupted communists who produce porn and spread religious propaganda. One of the main characters, Angel, is as close as he can get to a US rebellious leading man. The combination almost pastiche of genres contributes to keeping the viewer disoriented, unable to pinpoint the ultimate goals of the series and the best way to interpret its plot. I mean, a character like Angel, I don't think would have been allowed on Romanian television when he says everything you saw with your fist, that would not have been proper communist behavior, right? While Creed II uncritically reverts to nostalgia, Comrade Detective uses nostalgia, retro, and irony as the content that drives the plot. The series looks at the past and the present simultaneously and addresses both the communist and the capitalist worlds. Familiarity with the Cold War era as well as the post-Cold War present helps, but the series is so destabilizing that audiences need to be narratively flexible and skeptical of fixed positions to enjoy it. They can discover greater meaning if they are bilingual and bicultural. This is because irony occurs between discursive communities and it is a discursive strategy operating at the level of language or form, musical, visual, or textual. For example, almost every Romanian name listed in the beginning credits is a term for an animal. This includes the screenwriter, the producer, the lights operator, and you can see all of them there. <laughs> Among others, this is a short selection, right? <laughs> While some may actually be real Romanian names, their accumulation creates a comedic effect for the bilingual viewer. Since these names are not translated in subtitles, this effect is lost on the monolingual viewer. <coughs> the series makes fun of socialist stereotypes of the United States while simultaneously critiquing contemporary U.S. culture. The stereotypically overweight and burger-eating U.S. Embassy employees are loud and obnoxious and illustrate socialist critiques of capitalist decadence. 
and they point to overindulgence of the contemporary United States. When asking to see the US ambassador, the Romanian detectives are told that the ambassador is busy spreading freedom and democracy. The magazine in the waiting area of the embassy is called Guns and Ammo. The women working at the embassy, including the ambassador, who speaks with a strong southern accent, are flaunting their sexuality in contrast to the more tightly worn and conservatively dressed communist women. Comrade illustrates Linda Hutchins' view of irony as using both the said and the unsaid, the playing together of two or more <coughs> semantic notes to produce a third ironic one. The series develops an inclusive model of irony that allows for two meanings to be perceived simultaneously. Irony can be nostalgic and critical at the same time. It can help make fun of communists and articulate the self-critique of capitalism in the past and the present. This is most vi visible in the scene where Detective Angel researches US history in order to understand Bacho's traumatic coma in an episode tellingly entitled Two Films for One Ticket. So Bacho apparently traveled to America when he was a young child in part of his sports team and went out of his hotel room and witnessed American life and basically he has PTSD as an adult and falls into a coma and his partner thinks that understanding what happened to him in America is like a solution to the coma. Angel reads about the disputed underside of US history. The massacres of indigenous people, the Puritan witch trial of slavery, the discrimination and segregation of African Americans, the Vietnam War, all stories of humanitarian disciplining violence. While the documents he reviews are original Romanian publications, they point to the fact that US society has still not fully addressed its equity issues and societal tensions while proclaiming, proclaiming its superiority over other systems. <clears throat> Whereas in Creed, the rivals stay rivals, in Comrade Detective, the US and Romanian protagonists become unlikely allies. In episode five, the Romanian detectives seek refuge in the embassy after being framed for murder. To save Detective Bacio's wife, who is kidnapped by their nemesis, the two detectives leave the embassy dressed as country singers, assuming US identities. This change of clothes can be read as a reference to genre and its influence on the way we perceive identity. Genres are like clothes. The end of Comrade Detective, when Angel and the US ambassador wax nostalgic of their, over their impossible relationship, feels somehow authentic, while most of the relationships in the series feel like heavy-handed caricatures and laden with ideological values. Yet there are mo moments when the two sides help each other and sincerely grateful and untouched by the ironic doubling. The film encourages viewers to see beyond ideology and manufactured enmities. One of the characters says, our two countries may be in a cold war, but I'm burning hot for you. That's the solution, right, to war and conflict. Well, the communist detectives end up recognizing the humanity of the US other, and the recognition turns into actual collaboration. Comrade detective have earlier reminded the audience of the stakes of irony and its <coughs> double-edged critique. In episode six, Detective Bach recalls his, his and Nikita's trip to New York at a young age. I saw the reality, but Nikita, I saw the illusion, the American dream. That's why the Iron Curtain must always stay shut. The film engages in this final ironic doubling by critiquing the American dream, the hypocrisy of US exceptionalism, with the clear knowledge that communism has also failed. The point of view is double and continues to activate knowledge of both post-socialism and US reality. While the American dream has not reached its potential and maybe has been deteriorating depending on what interpretation one chooses, the communist ideal has failed as well, not reaching the predicted and sought after golden future. In her book on longing, Susan Stewart describes narrative as a structure of desire, a structure that both reinvents and distances its object and fulgurants the capacity of narrative to generate significant objects and hence to both generate and engender a significant other. The two cinematic narratives I examine today attempt to maintain or disrupt an image of the other created by previous nostalgic narratives of the Cold War. 
and Creed II, the present <coughs> and past are set in a continuous intense relationship, reinforcing and participating in each other's interpretation, but in the end they merely update the formula for the success of American exceptionalism and masculinity without redefining it. The American hero wins the fight and the post-socialist other is subdued and civilized. U.S. nostalgia is represented in its cinematic past and present glory and the Cold War dichotomies remain in place. In contrast, Comrade Detective offers a more productive, even, a, even if a more convoluted, engagement with the past. The series appeals to a more engaged audience through its many meta-narrative layers and biculturalism. While this formula does not promise the same commercial success as Creed, it escapes the risk of nostalgic exploration that remains mainly restorative and produces self and produces self-defensive monolithic identities. The series attempts to disrupt pathways of identification with the Cold War past and to critique national and personal identities also provides alternatives to Cold War nostalgia. Its provocative critique and instability risk rejections from uh, the audience since it is much easier and comfortable psychologically and ideologically to identify with the characters in Creed II and its clear-cut formula. Comrade Detective imagines a post-socialist space where Cold War binaries are not only less powerful but also becoming dissolved in favor of a more multivocal and truly post-Cold War space. Thank you. So, well, the rest of our time together, we'll have a Q&A. So does anyone have any questions for Dr. OPS? Yes. So, um, I wonder, have you seen the um, Marvel film Black Widow? Um, the, it was you know, so. right close to the pandemic. I sort of wonder how this idea of nostalgia would have played in that film that's focusing on women and sort of injecting <coughs> feminism and femininity into the spaces where masculine, masculinity is being injected in, in the Creed example that you talked that's about. That's an excellent question, but I don't know how to answer it because I don't remember Black Widow enough. Fair enough, <laughs> okay. But yeah, we can talk about it sure. at, at a later time, yeah. But there are several series, several movies like that that bring in, you know, the female agent Right, that brings uh, right. kind of a different kind of flavor to uh, to the series. But I'm wondering if it destabilizes or it's like the same thing but with a female. That's yeah, I mean that's what I think that might be some interesting. Mm -hmm. in, um, yeah, and using analytical. kind of different tools, right? The female cannot box, but she can seduce. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a different kind of weapon. Top Gun. Yes. What's fascinating to me about that movie is the complete blank that the other is. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And, yeah. and yeah. It, it's 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 amazing. There, there is absolutely no hint as to who these them these enemies are, right? Uh, other than they are enriching uranium. Mm -hmm. It could be anywhere in the world. You never see their faces, scenes. right? Yeah, we never see a face. They never speak. Or we never see. We never get a place name. Right. Nothing. It is it's, it's, it's absolutely. I wonder if we can read that as, um, well, you don't have to read it in any particular way, but as, as some sort of, there's, there's a bit of a worrisome trend right now in, in American politics of kind of cozying up to, um, to the hard line that, that used to be something we automatically um, opposed. So if we've got, uh, if we've got politicians, especially on the right, um, sort of saying nice things about Russia and their invasion of Ukraine or hinting at it, or saying nice things about Hungarian strongmen, uh, is, is the absence of, of, uh, of, of an other in uh, something like Top Gun maybe a reaction to that? I mean, that created a vacuum, right? When the Cold War ended, right. it's like, who do we hate now? Right. <laughs> right? And I was talking to McManus earlier, like we had the period where where the Middle Eastern terrorist was kind of the main enemy in a, in a whole bunch of movies. And then uh, you, you, they always go back to Russians in different flavors, right? It's the Russian mob or the Russian rogue agent or the Russian <coughs> dissident that is 
is just not the dissident anymore. So they're just trying to rewrite and reshape, but it's almost it's the same story all the time. But this kind of this vacuum is we need an enemy and in, in Top Gun, right? We don't know who this enemy is, it's there, it's the other. We need the other to be able to function. Is it because we can now project whatever enemy we want of that? Or is it because we have lost the capacity to identify a particular other that is ideologically useful? I think we're stuck in the story, right? In the ideological story that it's us and the enemy, and nothing else was created. No other discourse was powerful enough to displace that, that powerful Cold War dynamic. And there's always somebody that kind of appears as, as an enemy that takes that, that position. But it's, it's the narrative, it's the story that, that defines everything, in a sense. And what's funny about that is that Top Gun, in the original, is like this quintessential Cold War mm -hmm. film. And then the sequel is like the same thing, except let's depersonalize and de-identify who this enemy is, which would be really fun. Yeah, and just focus like, we're still the greatest, right? right? We're the best and the strongest and the handsomest and all of that. Whoever the other is doesn't matter, right? It's just self-affirming. Yeah. Sure. Sorry. Amazon, you know, membership, they, they have access to that. And it was, it was reviewed, and if you read uh, reviews, some people take it for real. They think, oh, if this was actually a film, and they say, how come I've never seen this film? <laughs> it's like, I, I'm not familiar with this film. And then when they realize it's a fake, it's like, oh, it wasn't like that. It's not, it's not real, it's not well made, it wasn't like that. So there's this kind of fight to, to establish its, its authenticity when that's the lack of authenticity is like the premise there. But the, at the end, I haven't showed you, at the beginning of each episode, Channing Tatum and the other producer, they show up and talk very seriously as if this was an actual film they discovered, <laughs> right? And you, have, you get the beginning credits that are the fake credits, and then at the end of each episode, you get the real credits. And this is an experiment that was done before by other filmmakers. It's not kind of like a new formula. But, yeah, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but the dubbing is the thing that first really pissed me off. <laughs> <laughs> like, why dub them? Again, this kind of silencing of the other. This complete and utter silencing of the other. And Channing Tatum said it was Amazon that wanted it dubbed. It didn't say, I couldn't find like why or why. It makes it ridiculous. Made. That's the, that's the signal for being ridiculous once you tell it. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's that mismatch, right, in dubbing yeah, between, yeah. even if you do it really, really well, there, there's a complete mismatch between gestures and faces and you know, all, of, all of that. And you leave certain parts undubbed. Like all the notes that characters exchange, they leave them untranslated in the series. So it's like, haha, you know, you, you may want to know everything while you walk. people say it's always political because it's always reinforced by something for a particular reason. And politicians are really, really good at uh, doing the reinforcement. And so you use a lot of, you know, images and words and gestures and holidays and, right? So it requires an apparatus in order to exist and to function. And often uh, images play that role and what uh, Landsberg with her prosthetic memory is saying, now we have access to so many images in our library of nostalgia that can be brought up, you know, uh, with a click. People can just bring up all sorts of images and bring them in our, in our library and play them and replay them. 
just something that's really characteristic to our to our period. It wasn't available before. And um, if you think about it, plays also into the whole system of uh, Pierre Nora's Year de Memoir, right? Where you have the signposts of memory and you have to repeat, always have the holidays remind people why they're a nation together. And nostalgia plays on those things again. You have to remind people why they need to hate that other regularly. So you have to show them the images and uh, remind them why the enemy is the enemy. You don't let them move away from that, from that narrative. And that's, what that, that's, I think, one of the smartest things in Creed, because they use the images of Rocky as if they're reality. So we, we know it's fiction, but it just, the film plays with our mind and to, to the point where it's almost reality. And we know the statue, right, of Rocky in Philadelphia. It's almost like this, this has been a real guy and we have a statue for him here. So the character is like there was a borderline between fiction and, and reality. I'm trying to remember in Romania in 1983, wasn't Ceausescu, this is sort of historical, so wasn't Ceausescu trying to play the American of the Soviets to a degree? <coughs> there was a period when he was sympathized yeah, 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 because he opposed, uh, what invasion did he oppose? Political science, please tell me. Yeah. yeah, the invasion of Czechoslovakia. <coughs> and who, he who kind of became yeah. the hero. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that didn't last forever. He was considered to be like this maverick communist leader for a while, but uh, that didn't last too long. The, the, uh, the topic of, for instance, the Cold War, other, actually remind me of something I'd heard not too long ago about the, the original Die Hard movie mm -hmm. uh, was when it was in development, they were actually planning on having it, it was essentially going to be a Cold War movie. Mm -hmm. It's going to be against the Russians. And then when it's in development, the Berlin Wall falls and everything, you know, it's like, yeah. oh, we've got to change it. And so we end up with pseudo terrorists who end up just being, uh, and the motive ended up just being the villains of just basically old-fashioned greed. And that's, that just seems kind of, you know, so we had that for a little while, and but now we're kind of Yeah, yeah, it goes in circles, because one of the newest diehards, I had the poster for yeah. it, it goes back that's to a Russian, it, yeah. to a Russian enemy, which, you know, seems to be a good guy, uh, but then he, he, he is bad, He's, he has one of these uh, greed motivations. When, um, what's his name, Bruce Willis goes to Russia to help his son out, yeah. You know, I was wondering about the, it's interesting to think about nostalgia of the Cold War from the U.S. point of view, looking at the, the victors, quote unquote, looking at it not, it, not as like necessarily as a traumatic mm -hmm. past. You know, I, I, and I'm sure that like in the, in the, in the East, you know, maybe they look, maybe look at it differently because it was, um, even though it was relatively peaceful, there was a collapse. I mean, I don't know if that affects like the humor, the way that there's the, the irony in, in some way, the fact that in the West it was sort of uh, uh, not a traumatic historical experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in a way it was. In some ways maybe it was. Yeah. And there's a lot of research that wants to establish this genealogy of nostalgia and follows the steps, the building steps back to the 50s. And the establishment, especially of American conservative identity. And you know, the guy with the Reagan mask in Comrade Detective, that's a signpost, right? So uh, they say all of this nostalgia comes from the building up of that American uh, conservative identity retracing its steps back uh, back to the 50s and this idea of, uh, of America. American exceptionalism, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And in the East, I mean, the degrees of nostalgia depend on how well the countries have fared, right, after, right. after communism. Right. The better the economical status, the less you know, nostalgia, visible nostalgia you have. You have it among generations as well. I was actually, Comic Detective, you said it was 2017? Yes. So, you know, with Russia's the bad guy again, with Ukraine.
Ukraine. So then you, you know, it sort of puts a new layer on mm -hmm. where this is mm -hmm. going. Or yeah, it yeah, it's like we were right, right? We were right to see yeah. Russia as the bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> Very different climate. So it's kind of, I was, when, I was, when that happened, I was like, my argument is falling apart. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Russia was the bad guy, as uh -huh. they were saying. But, but the way you say it, right, and, and the whole formula that has been, of course, you know, if you cry wolf, 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 right? Well, the ironic humor and detachment in the series takes very different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, you know, the whole Rocky sort of genre is very interesting in that, Part of it is, is, is this, the, the working class ethnic who, you know, really fights hard to kind of reach the top, and every ounce of effort comes in, and and and, and you, you kind of see this play out in, in, in Philadelphia being kind of a multi-ethnic place. They Rocky sort of viewed as this sort of working class sort of hero to the point where yeah, they know the sort of yeah the real and the imagined and this or that, but. Was it conscious of, because Sylvester Stallone, I don't think, wrote Rocky for the character to evolve. I mean, I don't think you look at it as sort of, this is going to be a cold, you know, mm -hmm. a cold warrior representing, you know, American exceptionalism. Was that, but did, did that, do you think, was that intentional as they were writing other movies? Do you think, do you think the studios wanted to sort of push, push this, this agenda, um, Forward, or was it simply just okay? Who Rocky's going to the next iteration of his journey? He's going to fight the most important heavyweight who mm -hmm. happened to mm -hmm. be from the Soviet Union. I think is it correlative, or is it? As far from? as I remember, Stallone had a lot of trouble convincing people to produce the first Rocky. He sank everything into it, so the story was not considered to be something popular. But then it became popular, and I think it was deliberate, very deliberate to, to have the Cold War storyline and for him to fight. Like, and especially if you watch the film, with the, that, that was like the prototype of the Soviet male, yeah. right? They built him for that purpose. Sure. So for him, this crappy guy from Philadelphia to fight this machine and defeat the machine that, that Ivan Drago was supposed to be, that was kind of like the ultimate. But it's interesting because in the subsequent films, Rocky V has nothing to do with this Cold War narrative. I mean, Rocky Balboa yeah. is sort of, <laughs> Adrian died, he's washed up, let me try, he writes this guy Mason the Lion Dixon. And there's that many times that you can repeat that formula. <laughs> but it, it took three more films to get back to this, so it's kind of interesting. I think a lot of observers of that wouldn't quite see it as the only reason, but it makes sense that it really, because a lot of, of all these things, it's amazing for a big series, the fourth film to be the most popular is unusual, yeah. except in this case, people usually see Rocky IV as the, because yeah, maybe it was because of that. Because right? of this, because uh, of the whole sort of whole war thing, yeah. Storyline, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I, well, go ahead. I, there are other people with their hands up. I would quibble with fourth film being the most popular. I've seen Rocky. Rocky, Rocky well, that, that's a fight you guys have. Don't worry. Calm it down. That was the only Cold War movies Stallone did in the 80s. I mean, the whole oh, well, where he meets the Trump Police Department when the North Vietnamese Army, and the whole Soviet Army. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, you had a question too. Do you believe there's the uh, underlying theme um, in the franchise with regard to the African diaspora here in America? And if so, how, how does that relate to the real world? In the new films, Creed is an African American actor. I think it's an attempt from Hollywood to update the story. That's how I interpreted it. Uh, otherwise, I don't think it has anything to do with. Uh, but I'll, I'll be happy to listen to to other points of view. But they needed they needed to update. I mean, Rocky Rocky cannot play Rocky anymore, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Obviously. But, so they needed to update the storyline in some way, and this was this was one way to do it. Do you believe that was kind of an effort to reach out to that ethnic group? Mm, definitely, like how definitely. Yeah, Rocky yeah. was meant to reach out to the working man. Mm -hmm. This was like the new Rocky. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. If you have to think, I guess, like how do you how do you 
think that the, uh, the future of film would like to develop with a new country, with Russia and uh, countries with, with China? Or how would you, how would you write it? I mean, how would I write it? Yeah, like I don't know, I'll, I'll try to not make, not make it what I criticized for an hour here, right? <laughs> But because we need a new narrative, right? But the, the world kind of likes the old narrative because it seems to be neat, but real life is not as neat as the narrative that, that we used to, to represent it. So uh, I will try to make it nuanced, but you know, Americans, the series is, is more nuanced. And uh, it just has all sorts of turns and of, of narrative and characters are not, you know, one thing, they develop and they change, and we get to know them more. But in this kind of Hollywood blockbuster formula, it's really hard to come up with something different and new. And if you see them, you know, reviving the, you know, the Nazi, you know, the, basically the Richard totalitarian as the I mean, that's one, another one of those stories that pops up all the time, right? Fighting, fighting the Nazis, and that's a favorite subject of the Russians, right? Part of their whole national identity is based on defeating the Nazis, and that's, you know, the great war and the glory of a whole generation of people fighting. So it's, it's, they, they finance these huge productions uh, related to that, but even in Western films, we see how often that, that topic pops up because it's another moment of uh, creating national identity and, and at the same time glorifying the, the national identity. And with China, China could be one of those others that fills the other gap, right? And then the narrative remains the same, only that the enemy is, is China. Thank you for Thank a you. very interesting.